So in today's episode is what I like to call an investment roundtable reflection. Our listeners are very aware that we're very active in building our investment portfolios, which ranges from property to business, stock, crypto. And with all the events that have happened over the last three years, I thought it would be a really good idea for us to have a conversation about what has worked well with us building our portfolios, what has not worked so well, what have we learned you know, what's been some of the interesting things around our decision-making process and what beliefs have we changed in the last 36 months? And then obviously to end with sort of what's some advice that we have for our listeners. So before we get into the episode, of course, let's check in with the guys and understand how everybody's doing. I'll start with uh, Daniel. Yeah, things are on my side um, are, are going very well. Um, I have been working for the, since the last time, um, since our last group recording without any time off uh, to Ollie's. What about uh, Recharge Week? No, no, we haven't. I've been working full okay. stop, flat out. Cool. Just making sure. No recharge days, uh, no time off. But yeah, but other than that, yeah, work's going well. Family's doing well. I've um, got some trips lined up in the coming weeks. So yeah, can't complain. Nice. Olu, you going to go take it next? Yeah. Good. Um, still on my road to recovery um, and getting closer and closer to my return on that football pitch. Um I'm not wearing the knee support anymore. I, sh I would show you, but, you know, I don't want to be demonetized on YouTube, you know, by showing my knees and everything there. Um, but, yeah, I'm recovering well. Work is busy, starting to get to that busy period. Mm. Um, i got to think about taking some time end of October, sort of November, for the birthday month, going somewhere. And we're getting so close to the year, end of the year. It feels like this year has gone super sure. quick. Yep. Um, so it's good. Oh, and I was um, babysitting my nephews um, last weekend, which was amazing. Spending time with them, playing football with them. Um, I went to one of their training sessions and the youngest one, who's three years old, the coach was like, I haven't seen anyone that good in the last 30 years of coaching. Um, I'm more than happy to put him in contact with West Ham. I got contacts there. My brother, his dad was like, nah, it's too early. He's only three years old. We don't want to put him in one sport now. But I've got some videos I'll send you guys in the group. He's using left foot, right foot, going in through cones at three years old. He's doing stuff that put P to shame at three years old. So what? the Yo, sky so is the ceiling. Was he left foot or right foot? Uh, he's right foot, but he uses both. Like he, he just, he's a sponge. He just soaks up so much information. So, you know, when you're going in and out of cones, I know most of the listeners don't want to hear about this. But he's going in with his left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot. And he just finds it so easy. So talented already. So yeah, he's I'll my put... retirement plan. So i got to make get sure. Some, get, get some contacts I'll get, I'll get, in Saudi, yeah, man. Get, Forget West Ham. He hasn't seen Karen. <laughs> he's only, he's only, the coach has only said that because he hasn't seen Karen. Anyway, oh, cool. sure, I'll go send you the videos. You'll see. Joe, what I was thinking though, Olu, is, um, I mean, alhamdulillah, your uh, nephew skill, but I was thinking he needs to coach his uncle, big man, before you start, like, you know, <laughs> before you start coaching him. Well, I thought, I thought more the other way around. Teach uncle how to get back on the get back on the grass. Um, but yeah, all, all good from from mine. Actually, had a really good a uh, really good couple of weeks traveling around the UK, and also um, went to a Manchester United game with my family. So the first time for all of us to collectively go, and it was an eye opening experience. Um, I wouldn't probably recommend traveling that far again for a football game, but in this case, we we did win, so that was nice. And it was a good experience with the with the family. But overall, all all good, and looking forward to this great episode that Pavilo has put together. Nice, yeah. On my side, uh, great as always. Family's well. Uh, the boys are at a stage now where they're they're playing a lot more. They're sort of running around, and a yarn's on his feet, so it's uh, it's actually really really cool to see. Um, so uh, yeah, all good. And uh, looking forward to diving into today's episode. Take off, take flight with you. Yeah, we never fly, but we're flying. So before perhaps we get into our roundtable reflection, investment portfolio discussion, I think it would be quite important to just set the scene uh, and, and talk from a, first of all, from a macro standpoint. We've, we've spent a lot of time on different episodes talking about the events that have happened over the last three years. But I'll just quickly go through kind of what we've experienced in the last three years. And then talk a little bit about what we've been able to do in that time. So firstly, we've had a pandemic where the world has literally stood still for just under a year. We've then experienced interest rates in the UK reaching an all-time low. We've then seen record levels of quantitative easing where money's been injected into the system. We've seen the economy contract across you know, several quarters of, of, and seen negative growth. 
been conversations about recessions and, and is a recession now, is a recession coming later. We've then seen high levels of growth across different asset classes in 2021. And that has then led to sort of, or then we've also seen a inf high inflationary environment. We've also seen political tension between countries, which has led to supply chain challenges, utility cost challenges. We've also seen political members change and legislation change. And now as of recent, we're now seeing rising interest rates. So much has happened in that 36 months. And what we've been able to do, and this is why I think it'll be good to reflect. So that's at the macro level. And on the micro level, we have been in transactions over 5.5 million pounds in property. And that's a combination of also buying and selling. We've as a group raised over two and a half million, both from private investors and also commercial debt from lenders. We've transacted in over a quarter of a million uh, thousand pounds in, in stock market and also in crypto. So that's also buying and selling. And we've also created new income with that activity. And we have, we've added an additional 75 uh, tenants to our portfolio under management. There have been promotions within our professional uh, positions. We've also had people transition into new chapters. So much has happened within that 36 months. And that's just added to what we already had coming into 2020. So I thought it would be really good to actually get some pause, do a check-in and get some reflections on what, when you look back over the last three years with what's happened within the market, I think we've seen every single facet you can imagine within a particular economy. And what have been our learnings? What's worked well? What's not worked so well? What beliefs have we changed as a result of, of that? Because you can call it, really call it like a, like a real MBA we've experienced. And then what advice do we have for sort of our listeners? So who would like to kick off with maybe a, you know, a key learning as to what's worked well in their own personal investment building portfolio journey? I was, I was going to start with something very quick and very brief is I think what the th last three years have learned me when looking at it from an investment standpoint, there's never the right time. You can always, from P, what you shared of what's happened in the last three years, from the whole world standing still to macroeconomic conditions, political tensions amongst countries. If you're waiting for the perfect time to invest, you'll be waiting forever. And whilst you're waiting, the value of that money you have to invest is going to decrease in its value, in its purchasing power. So I just wanted to start off to say that there's never the right time. The, the right time is always now. The, the, sorry, the, the right time, the, the best time was yesterday. The second best time is right now. So if there is anyone who's looking to invest or wanting to invest, you can't control all the external conditions or all the external factors. You have to just research what you're investing in and go in with great conviction and you know stick to what your strategy is. That's what I was just going to start with. That's exactly what I was going to say as well. <laughs> no, <I'm not> <laughs> um, let, me come, let me come from a different angle. Um, I totally agree with what um, Daniel said. I, I'll take it from a, a separate side. I think one thing that has worked well I've learned from the last sort of three years is ensuring that my fixed cost is low. And what I mean about that is um, I think we've been in such a low interest environment and we didn't really understand the luxury of that, right? But I was so happy that looking at my personal finance, I wasn't levered up on car payments, um, other sort of fix, like a large mobile phone or a yacht somewhere or some random outgoing, which didn't allow me or doesn't allow me to truly invest everything else I've got especially in the phase of the world, uh, phase of like our lives and chapters that we're currently in, which right now we're in the stage of aggressive, aggressively grown wealth. The only way you can truly do that is having capital either through your earned income or through investments or loans and aggressively invest in that. And a downside to it is if you're sort of reducing that income or a money to or capital to invest by having large amount of fixed um, bills fixed cost you're not really able to do that so that's one of the things that I sort of valued and I focused on really during the last um, sort of few years was how do I ensure I keep that low not upsizing and moving to a three bedroom house by myself just to feed my ego but having two thousand three thousand outgoing where instead I can stay in my apartment, right? My two-bedroom apartment. Um, even if I wanted to downsize to a one-bedroom apartment, if that was going to free up that fixed cost so that I can heavily invest, um, which uh, would be my second point, which I think Daniel mentioned in terms of there's no, never really a right time. 
but you've got to be in this game. Like mm. you can't be on the sideline. I think mm. that is one of the things I learned. Like there's always that fear factor of, oh, am I going to lose my money? Right. But I look at this as, and I think I talked about this on a previous podcast is you're always going to lose your money, mm. right? You're either going to spend it, which means it's not going to stay there. So you're either going to spend it on life experiences, traveling, eating out, living good standard of living. You're either going to lose it by inflation. So the value of it, the purchasing power actually dropping down, or you can invest and you've got a chance of, okay, potentially maybe losing it or growing it to such a way that it generates a mass amount of wealth that will help you, your future, your future family. And especially during this period of time, if you're building the knowledge, you'll realize that investing is not as difficult as a lot of people talk about, um, especially when you're doing more sustainable investing. And what I mean sustainable investing, I mean not trying to get a quick 100% return in six months, right? That's where people start to you lose all your money, where you're like, oh, I got this great idea that you can think about and go for, uh, that, give me... Oli, yeah. Oli, that, that's not investing, that's gambling. That's gambling, exactly. <laughs> but so many people think it's investing, right? They're like, I got this great idea, this uh, NFT, right? Let's not even talk about how they said, like, what, 90% of them are worth zero or nothing, right? I got this great NFT. I'm not going to lie, I was going to start up an NFT because I was like, are people this dumb to be just buying random <laughs> stuff, right? But no, on a serious note, there's more sustainable ways for you to invest, which is... In, I don't like to use the word guaranteed, but there's a lower chance or probability of you losing money when you're looking at S&P 500, like massive funds, which are made up of multiple um, companies and stocks. So I just sort of narrowed down and just studied, right? So I think for me, I don't want to, I pass it on to Shua afterwards. It's really those three key factors that I sort of worked well for me and I continue doing is one, reducing my fixed costs, which allowed me to have opportunity to invest a large amount of money. Secondly, um, getting involved, not being on the sideline and actually investing, right? And really, thirdly, is really educating yourself during this period of time. And when I mean educating, it's not educating for the sake of, oh, one day I'm going to invest, not educating whilst investing, mm. right? So those are the three things. Yeah, great good. points. Love it. Um, Olu, Shuo share kind of few things that have worked well on yeah. your journey yeah what's good is actually sitting here listening i was thinking to myself Do you know what? daniel and olu going first has completely screwed me over because they basically covered the the key points i wanted to That's say why but maybe if I... To go first. <laughs> I know i know i know but maybe okay Joe, I'll, I'll, I'll say the the two points that i had which will, i think complement the ones that you guys have said already so far but i'll also give my my perspective on it i think the two that i had one was really around around self-awareness and education which i think both of you talked about it in in some essence so i think that self-awareness and education the big shift the last couple of years was recognizing the following, that my knowledge is limited, but what I don't know is limitless. And I think the problem was for a very mm. long time, I had it the other way around, where I thought what I knew was limitless. So I basically knew everything. And what I didn't know was limited. But having that self-awareness to check myself and be like, okay, if you really want to do real estate, Shreo, you need to really learn to do it properly. And if you want to learn to do it properly, learn from people who are doing it even better with less than what you have. And I think putting the ego aside and doubling down on that self-awareness and education unlocked a world of opportunities. And then the next one, the second point is really having the, the courage to go for it. And I think, Daniel, you said about how there's all these different reasons to not do it. You just have to do it. And I think, Olu, you also said about having the commitment to get into the arena. And that's really the the second piece where you can learn as much as you want, but if you don't ultimately implement it and invest and put some put your hand in the ring and have some skin in the game, then all of that education becomes almost redundant in itself. So those are the two points that I had. And I think it complements the, the ones that Daniel and Oliver have said so far. Nice. Well, thanks. So as you're saying that something, it brought back something I read either yesterday morning around 5 a.m. or... Uh, the day before around 5 a.m., um, someone was posting themselves in the gym, a piece of equipment in the gym uh, at a timestamp. Who's this? And it said, it said, valid reasons are still excuses. And that is mm. very true. And that was said none other than Babilo, Babilo Timbo. Ah. That valid reasons are still excuses. Yeah. That's that's I, like that. I, like, I, like, I like that. I like that. I like that. Love that. Where did you get that quote from? 
<laughs> which, wise, which wise person did you get that quote from? <laughs> I live it. It comes from within. If I'm living it, it comes from within. So that's, that's what it is. Yeah, go ahead, Daniel. No, no, I just wanted to make that point to the fact that if you're waiting for the right time or mm. a number of excuses, they might be valid, but it's still an excuse. It's a valid reason, but it's an excuse. So we need to what get about out you? of that, that what way about you was yes, the, so for me, I think when, looking back, and I, and I particularly wanted to pick from 2020 till now, because I, we all came into 2020 with a particular plan, and that all got, let's say, you know, thrown in our face because of the COVID pandemic. For me, when I, when I look back at one of the things I probably say has worked really well, very simple, but very effective if done well, which is the power of reaching a point in your life where you sit down and you make a plan. And your plan can be, I'm going to, in my case, use my corporate earnings and use that to create cash flow. Very, very simple. But then the execution becomes, say, challenging because you have the ups and the downs. But the ability to make a plan, make it simple, and then see it through. Because what happens in doing that is, one, you start to learn within yourself a process works that I set. Your belief strengthens in the midst of everything that's happened. And I think then it strengthens your understanding and belief for what you want to go on to do next, right? So... I think, you know, I think in just developing that plan, executing that plan, you know, showed financial discipline, the ability to first make the money, save the money, and then put it into um, pieces of property that you're hoping will continue to cash flow, you know? And, and so when it does, every single month it comes in, it strengthens your belief that this actually worked. So I think, I think there's the broader point for, for audience is, is that power of making that plan because people don't make plans. What comes very simple to us is not simple to others. Or, you know, and so making that plan and then following through on that plan, even when there's other investments um, that, you know, potentially may even look more attractive, you still want to stick with perhaps what you're doing. I think maybe the last, the other second point is also the power of not diversifying. I think it's very important. Everyone in their investment life cycle needs to understand at what point do I diversify and what point do I not? And I think you need to reach, and that could, the number could change depending on who the individual was. So I think for me, it was also powerful to say, look, I'm, I'm going to commit to buying single family homes with the focus of putting in young growing families in these houses to then cash flow and hold for the long term. I am fully aware that there are other strategies that make more money, but I like the story of using my corporate earnings to create cash flow in this particular asset class. As you're going along in that journey, you see other people making money in other asset classes. Should I change? Should I do? Because I'll get to my end destination faster. You know, so, but, but the, the, what I actually realize is the power of not diversifying is you get a chance to understand your asset class really well. So it's not just about how much money can you make elsewhere? How well do you understand what you're doing? So if you give that some time, I, th I think that really works. So for me, making a plan, executing on a plan, and then not diversifying. I, th I think with that, it'll be good to understand what has not worked so well in the last three years or a big learning, something that you may change? Sure, please. Yeah, so I'll go uh, first on this one because I learned my lesson with the with the previous round. I think, and actually this complements what, what you've just said, Pierre. I think my biggest learning is actually not to diversify too early because if I look at how the things have performed in terms of my investments that I've made, the best ones are overwhelmingly the ones where I spent 80% of my focus on. Mm. And in the other areas, maybe there was a period where it went really high or low or et cetera. But because I wasn't fully focused on it, it wasn't an area that I was kind of being drawn towards in my personal time. It wasn't, there was there weren't really news articles that I was following in in that space. I just wasn't as committed to it. And then ultimately the performance of those investments have tracked to that level of interest. So that's been the biggest learning where I think at this stage, and Olu, I, I, lo I love the way that you've said it because it's really aggressive building stage that we're in at the moment. It pays to be very focused. And then once you get to a particular point, whatever that point is for you, where you feel more comfortable to take these diversified bets, then maybe do it later on. But for me personally, that's the biggest reflection where in hindsight, I probably should have focused even more on that on that one uh, asset. Yeah. Before I give it to Olu, can I just say, I think it's very important to the listeners that if you have someone like Daniel as a close friend who's into crypto, you have to manage someone like that very, very carefully. Because when crypto was the thing to invest in, <laughs> he was calling me every other day to say, listen, I'm part of this group, that group, this group, that group. We're making X number of returns. So what I did is I started to do my research, even though I'm heavily focused on single family homes and buy to lets. That's where my focus is. And I thought, okay, cool. You know, based on Daniel's guidance, let me make a move. Let me make a move. So I sold, I sold a healthcare stock. 
And I you, make, you make it sound like I was reckless. Wait, wait, wait. I shifted. I told him. I shifted. And I told my, I, said, I said to Lauren, listen, I said, Lauren, watch this move I'm about to make. Watch. We're going we're gonna to triple our money. So I, I saw the healthcare stock. <laughs> I moved it into um, Ethereum. And let's just say wherever it is today, <laughs> it's nowhere near what I, I promised Lauren that I was going to make. So, and that, Lauren, that's, 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 that's today. She, that's today. Don't if worry, she that's listened today. to this episode, this will be the first time her hearing that the money that we were supposed to make, we didn't make. Anyways, uh, Oli, go ahead. <laughs> Lauren's going to be looking at you like, you make me she's looking at you like, when I see Lauren, Lauren she's going to come and I'm going to get one thump in the face. <laughs> the, the, the lesson there is, listeners, stay focused. But, but, just, but just, just one one very quick comment, Oli, before passing it to you. But that is actually a prime example where Daniel is in a space, he's understanding the space, he knows a great network in that space, and he's continuously updating his knowledge in that space, right? So for Daniel to make the plays that he's doing makes complete sense because that is his alpha, if you want to say. Whereas P, in your case, for example, real estate is your bread and butter that you've had that focus on. So I think, if anything, that emphasizes the, the point that we just uh, just made. Yeah, Laurie's looking at you like, yo, you promised me a bag. You promised me a Birkin bag <laughs> and I haven't received <laughs> it. <laughs> no, 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 I, no, I, I, I want to confirm. This was in 2020. This wasn't last year. This was 2020. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, this, this was 2020 when like everyone's at home and uh, the whole the whole craze was going on. Yeah, this was 2020. I remember this. Yeah, In the last year and a half, I've been, I've been quiet. I've just been like, you know what? Yeah, the difficulty is like, it, 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 yeah. it was it was really up, and then the difficulty is you so, tell people when to buy stuff, and it's a great thing, but you never always sometimes tell them when to sell, and when mm. you're like, okay, this is my yeah. play. I think slightly different from you guys, or maybe is I look at some of the mistakes I've made, not through quote unquote losses on my investments, um, but more missed opportunities. So what I mean about it, because I say most of my biggest investment mistakes have been stuff that I've seen, recognized, but I haven't gone in with the right amount of conviction that I needed to. So perfect example of this was the um, t- February 2020. The market crashed right in February, saw a massive decline. I dabbled in there, maybe through maybe 2K in there, right? I knew from my years of research into the stock market, historical crashes, that this was going to recover, right? I don't know if it's going to recover in one year, two years. I didn't expect it to recover as quickly as it did, but I knew it was going to recover. And my biggest mistake in that period of time is I didn't throw more into it, right? Mm. Because it was a conviction that I knew and I was 100%, right? And I could have been like, everything I've got in savings accounts, whatever, I should have thrown it into, especially stuff which are more safe, like the S&P 500 in my so, mind. So, so, sorry, just go there. What stopped you? What stopped you from going all in? Fair. Fair. But if you but if you said, but then what's gonna what would stop you next time? Because if you had that hundred percent conviction, but the fear is there, if say tomorrow that same opportunity and you knew with great conviction. Would that yeah. fear still not grab you? That fear will still always no, be present. No, because what I've now, what I've had to work on, right? And I say investing is got to do with intelligence, but it's also got to do with your psychology and a mental state in regards to how much value you have on certain things, right? Whereas in the grand scheme of things, right, I would be fine. I already got somewhere to live. I would have been fine in that. But the conviction I had, like right now, um, and I don't, again, and we'll probably give the disclaimer at the end. And in the quote, this is not an investment. Obviously, speak to your own invest, um, uh, financial advisor. But there's been positions that I've been heavily investing in, right? Which I wasn't doing in 2020. 2020, I was just more focused on work. I'm, I'm talking about building massive positions where Good. you're trying to build close to a thousand stocks of a particular company. Right, market moving positions, yeah, yeah, right. yeah, good. I was, <laughs> market moving <laughs> positions. I mean, I don't, the, 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 the first one hundred down three points today right. after a big sell off. All lose the man. All lose the man. I'm going to change. I'm going to change. I'm going to change your phone number from my phone from Oli Okanola to the Whale Okanola. <laughs> I wish. I far far from the well, but the amount of capital I'm deploying now. It's completely different to what I was doing before. Like I've set certain goals where it's like 
I don't want to miss out on that opportunity where I look at all my kids, my wife and kids look at me in 20 years time and say to me, what were you doing? Oh, with your time and your money. You were live doing that massive rally of this. And what were you doing? doing and I'll be like, oh, I only put 500 pounds in it. I'll be like, <laughs> especially when, like, especially when they can what? listen back to these take flight podcast episodes. We're like, Oh dad, you were the guy when it came to stock. What happened? <laughs> See, what happened in those situations? <laughs> <laughs> so, and I don't expect this to be overnight, far from overnight movies, right? Um, but it's more, I've released that fear element. I, to be honest, I don't even look at it more as even my money. Maybe I've, that's the key thing. I've removed my mindset to not thinking about my money. And it's just like, it just goes there. It just Number, goes there, right? And again. In, in, in 10, 20 years time, hope, I pray that I follow the right philosophies, didn't go for hype stock, um, stocks and stuff like that, very household strong names, right? And I could look at and be like, yo, guys, we're all going on that PJ together. Like, that's the that's the hope, right? So I think that is... You, you funded it, yeah? You funded it, yeah? Yeah. If anything, um, bro, if you're the, he's if not, you're, if you're he's the not let way go of like, owner, yeah. mate, you're booking that flight on our behalf. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the way you're, the way you're talking now... <laughs> I'm never going to let coming. go of that PJ. I'm never going to let go of that PJ expense. <laughs> I'll, I'll be the reason why the reason like i said to you working so hard right now the reason i'm working so hard right now <laughs> no, i'm gonna pj to it myself was, it, was, it was after <laughs> yo it was after the pj experience he said no nah, i've got to take bigger positions i'm taking bigger positions <laughs> no, i had to i had to because i remember we did that episode about what would you do if you won the lottery right and Pete was like, i'll take all of you on a trip and he was like i'll send you back to your apartment and i was like there's no way you're giving me a good life and send me back to my apartment now these guys are actually booking private. First it was a joke. Oh, what would you do if you were a millionaire booking private jets? So now you guys actually booking private jets. I'm like, yo, what's going on here? I need to step up my game. So <laughs> what I'm saying is I had to up that position so that I can actually afford to get on that PJ. <laughs> I'm telling you. But I'll hey, say, yeah, Oli, my be careful. Mistake. Be careful with that. With them positions, be careful, man. Hey, <laughs> don't get around yeah, those <laughs> because these big positions mean to be big Wipe rewards or big losses. They could be, <laughs> but I always say a lot of my investments are in funds, like larger funds. So if they go to zero, I always say we're going to be end of world scenario. Aliens have come, end mm. of the world scenario. Money doesn't matter at that particular time. It's going to be gold and um, properties, I guess. But yeah, those are going to be the with two that, important with, things. With that philosophy, I know it's sidetrack, we're going off a sidetrack a little bit. Mm. With that philosophy, you, I can almost start to see now why you would say it's not my money anymore. Because if I dump my money in one of these funds and the whole fund goes to zero, then mm. we've got bigger problems to we've worry about. We've got bigger problems. So that's so the way I look at the, yeah. the mentality that you built here because it's almost like a, I dump whatever I've got, I'm, I can afford to lose. Mm. So, so you could be setting yourself up for some really big gains. Um, and, and I never that. and I never put myself into like again, I don't do leverage, right? So it's never a situation I can lose more than I've invested. Right. right. So it's not a situation that all of a sudden they say, yo, you owe two million, right? Yeah. So that's on my side. I'll let Daniel, you go. Daniel, if you want to share great uh, insights, Olive, if you want to share maybe what hasn't worked so well or a big learning that you would do differently over the from the last three years. Oh yeah, that's good. Well, this my, my response works either way of like what would what has worked or what hasn't worked. I think one thing that hasn't worked is, and if you catch it, you catch it. The <laughs> money in the bank is worth less. The money in the bank is worth less for a number of reasons. Inflation being one. Um, but the reason I say that is because, you know, my wife and I, we had started like savings for our son from when he was born, mm. and we we're just putting the money into a savings account, and actually. Over time, yes, that money would grow, but over time, that money would also lose its value. Mm. So one thing I did quite recently this summer um, in one of my uh, recharge weeks, Olu, was I did some I did some research on some ICES or investment accounts for young children, and I opened up a Vanguard account for him, which is where we put the money we'd saved into some funds that would grow over time, but also we can do it on a recurring and a frequent basis. So, for example, when birthdays come or when people want to gift him money, of course, it will be spent on him or for him. But the money that's not used or allocated will not just sit in a bank account. It would rather sit in an investment account for him. So when he's 18, it's grown over time. So that's the one thing I would say I've learned that hasn't worked so well is leaving the money in the bank. Fortunately, it's only been a year and a half that we've left it in and we've done something fairly quickly around it. However, I would also say, that I had on my to-do list from before he was born to open one up, which I hadn't done. So it only took me a year and a half, but alas, we're here and we've, I've done it. 
So yeah, that's one thing I, I would nice. I would share. And actually, I'm actually share a few a few um, points on that on my personal Instagram page over the coming weeks because it was shared with me or something I wanted to do. But the, the greater detail actually came across in another group I'm in from a father who was in a similar position, and he's actually a partner at Cornerstone Partners, um, one of uh, one of one of a big uh, partner vent VC. So yeah, that that's one thing I learned. Very nice. I think it's a great, great um, point for, for our listeners. So I'll share, before we sort of wrap up on one of our last points around what beliefs may have changed uh, in the last three years, my learning has been, uh, it's very important to focus on how you can upskill yourself within the same investment strategy. So naturally what we say is whenever we're going to embark on a new strategy, we have to learn before we play the game. But if you take, for example, a plan of buying, say, 10 buy to lets and you buy each buy to let the, the exact same way, or 20 or 30, how much have you really learned unless you decide to make tweaks and changes along the way so you can actually learn more? So I think it's this element of, maybe I'll give a very simple example. For the first couple deals, you use your own money. Then the next set of deals, you want to use some investor money. Then the next set of deals, you think about a different way of financing. What you're trying to do is within the same strategy is you're actually upskilling yourself even better and maximizing that opportunity. So I think that's just something that I recognized, uh, you know, over the last three years that potentially I could have made some change and tweaks within the same space and actually got more out of it, uh, even though the end point from a cash flow standpoint would still probably be the same. Last, last uh, point, it's just really around, does anyone have actually any strong, or before 2020 started, you had a very strong belief on, I think this is actually the way forward. This is the plan. This is the blueprint. And the last three years have, have maybe told you, actually, you might want to think differently about it. I, I have I have something to share. So, so for, for me, actually, what, one of the th uh, beliefs that I've, as you guys know, I'm, I'm pro property, pro, pro property, 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 buy property, buy property. And I think what I've learned over the last couple of years is it's very important to understand sequencing when building wealth. So, so what should you potentially work on first in your early years and then maybe look forward to doing that at a later stage? I've come to learn that actually property, whilst it's a great investment vehicle, more, more importantly, it's a great store of wealth. And that could have actually been something which I could have worked on later on in my career. In the end, we're winning either way. But I'm, I'm just thinking about how can you empower your sequencing? If I was to go back and start again, really from a young age, what I would have really focused on is looking to, rather than start a brand or start a business, buy a brand, buy a brand and buy a business look to build that over a number of years before then getting into the store of wealth, which is, which is that of property. So my, one of my strong beliefs is, is, has been thinking about sequencing and not to be so pro property to the point where you miss what should maybe you could do before you get into that investment vehicle. Anyone else with maybe a strong belief that has changed? Um, I think strong belief, I would even say probably be education that's come across is similar to what you said is um, the different values and different stuff, different elements, right? So what I mean about that is cash flow, right? And generating cash flow is what really gives you freedom because you can have a lot of your money tied into your pension or into your home, right? But it doesn't give you freedom because you can't take money. You don't get a monthly payments from your house, your residential home, or you don't get monthly payments from your, your pension stocks, right? It's stuck there, right? So I think one of the biggest things I started working on is, okay, how do I generate a lot of, um, or cash flow, which will buy my freedom, right? I think that's the versus really just being heavily focused on net worth and net worth. Um, and um, yeah, I would say that would be on my side. I pass on to the rest of the guys. I think I think that's perfect. I think with that, uh, I think we've so no Olu, great. I think thank you for sort of sharing. Shuel, maybe would you want to share one of your strong beliefs that have been changed over the last three years? So again, I don't want to repeat anything. The great points that you've uh, you've said, P and Olu, on on that question. The the last thing that I'll just say, just to close from my side, is the power of being consistent. Right. I was just looking through our episodes, and around that time, P, that you've started this discussion from January 2020 we as a podcast were on episode number 41 
right? And now this is episode number 203. And I think that's actually a great representation of why the things where you get the best outsized returns are the things where you're very consistent with. I think for us, if we were back in episode 41 and we replayed this conversation back to us then, like, okay, in the next three years, this is what you guys are going to do. These are the reflections mm -hmm. that you're going to have and what you've achieved. We would assign that deal like ASAP before someone pulled that away from us. So I think right, it's just right. a reflection of staying consistent with whatever you're trying to do. We've done 160 episodes since that discussion. Hopefully we do another 200 more, but I thought that was a good reflection on how whatever you're trying to do, whatever you're trying to invest in, long-term is where you get that benefit. And I think our podcast is a, is a nice representation of that. Nice. Olu, you had a point. Sorry, just, and it's not really specifically to the this question, but one of the, I would say, joyous moments I had in 2023 was I did something last year where I made a conscious decision to say I'm going to have a group of friends right who I'm really close with that maybe don't invest that much or invest as much as um, as I do and really force them or encourage them heavily encourage them to invest especially if you remember last year we had a massive dip especially in the stock market and I remember I told them look I basically spent weeks walking them through step by step how to open a stocks and shares I saw how to invest in the stocks and shares I saw um, what to pick pretty much and one of the most rewarding conversations I had which brought so much joy I'm not going to mention the person's name called me a few weeks ago and basically said to me yo I checked my Vanguard ISA and the man has gone up is crazy like and I was just like that brought so much joy to me because I was like would and I know we do the podcast and we're giving people information but having someone so close to you and telling them look I understand the fear I understand the complexity let's try and break it down to such as as simple as possible and really hold them accountable to say look even if you started with 100 pounds do that like each month and open ones for your kids as well. And I love what you're doing, Daniel, and the fact that you went out and did that because in 10, 20 years time, I always said, and I, I talk about this, the biggest disappointment would be if I make it and I look around and none of the people around me mm. are people that I grew up with, I will feel like I failed as well because that means I saw a secret, I saw a path, I went on that journey alone and I didn't pull people through. So I just wanted to mention that because that was just... Uh, joyous moment for me yeah great guys there you have it uh over the last 36 months five and a half million in property two and a half million in debt a quarter of a million in the stock market uh over 70 tenants have been added to, the, to our portfolio all of which we've added to what we already had starting lessons learned reflections which i think has been really really great over to you daniel we're gonna start start our vc arm it's gonna be take flat take flat capital tfc um, not that joke could have played, but yeah, no. We first, firstly, I want to just express that everything shared in this episode was not for financial advice. It was based on our own experiences. If there's anything you want to invest in, we 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 urge that you seek um, a professional for for guidance and for help in the maybe in the form of a financial advisor, and make sure that you do your own research. But you know, we hope this episode, episode two hundred and three, has been enlightening, uplifting and also encouraging for you all. This is no, by no means for us to gloat about our achievements, but, but merely be transparent with you in the lows as well as the highs. So without further ado, you can find us on Instagram at Take Flight Podcast, as well as on YouTube and TikTok. But until next time, stay safe, look after yourselves, and God bless. Take off, take flight with you. Yeah. Fool, we never fly, but we're flying.